Great. Well, good morning or good afternoon, um, everybody. It's nice to have a, a, a good group of people here. Um, I'm assuming that you can all um, hear, um, uh, um, hear and see what you're supposed to. If not, please do put something in the um, in the chat box. Um, so Aditya Bahadur and myself both work in the Human Settlements Group at IIED. Um, and over the last 14 um, uh, CBA conferences, um, we've tried consistently to have uh, um, at least one thread of thinking in the conferences that considers um, some of the um, issues facing low-income groups in um, cities in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, um, around um, usually around um, how community groups and community action um, can play an effective role in building resilience to climate change. Um, so the, um, the session today is really a, a, a continuation of that thinking. Um, and what we have is a set of um, ideas really that um, Aditya has been leading on developing that I've been working on as well, um, where we try and frame some new thoughts about um, the nature of risk facing um, cities in the um, global south and particularly facing their, um, their lowest income residents and thinking about what a different mode of resilience um, would look like in response to that. And so that's the framing of disruptive risk. Um, and disruptive resilience, minutes or so, and then hopefully we'll have a, a good amount of time for reflections and comments um, um, and discussion about the value of this. And um, crucially, I think as well, how we can take um, some of these emerging ideas on disruptive resilience and turn them into practically useful policy relevant um, responses. Aditya. Great. Thank you very much, David. So as you rightly indicated, the narrative for our presentation is fairly simple. Our contention is that the nature of risk that cities are facing is shifting, and therefore we need a change in risk management and resilience processes, protocols, and practices. Um, and when we say risk is changing, uh, we talk about how outlier events that are climate extremes are uh, increasing. The IPCC special report on extreme events outlined how a number of climate-induced extreme events are on the rise. And with COVID-19, this is more evident than ever. Statistically, there's around a 1% chance of a pandemic like COVID-19 happening uh, in any given year. So it's definitely a clear outlier event. At the same time, risk is now taking place at a large scale. Most countries across the world are ready for emergencies and exigencies unfolding in a few different places concurrently. But in large countries like India, Brazil, the US, every single state, every single large city has faced an onslaught from COVID-19. And the fact that this has been a protracted crisis that has delivered an acute shock uh, on an ongoing basis has also meant that a number of other shocks and stresses now take place even as one shock, shock is taking place. To give you one tangible example of this, uh, earlier this year, when Cyclone Amphan battered the southern coast of Bangladesh and the eastern coast of India, just at that same time, at that, at that point, these places were also experiencing uh, COVID-19. And in Odisha, that has traditionally battered, uh, uh, that has traditionally been battered by cyclones, has a number of cyclone shelters in place, but at this time, 25% of all the cyclone shelters that had been built were being used as COVID-19 isolation centers. And therefore, uh, resources are really being stretched thin. All this is exposing weaknesses in existing systems. Uh, we've all heard about you know, uh, the lack of um, uh, ventilators and then a shortage of intensive care beds but really more fundamental weaknesses in existing protocols of risk management are really now coming to light. For instance, um, I read a fascinating article that talked about how India's Disaster uh, Management Act that was launched to much fanfare in 2005 after the tsunami, people are now realizing that it fails to adequately classify what a disaster is, as a result of which certain institutions like India's National Disaster Management Authority 
uh, that are empowered to deal with an emergency such as this are not leading on COVID-19 response. And that's actually being led by a whole host of other institutions. David? So the final point here is around some of the other new forms of risk. And some of them are ones which I think um, have been recognized in, um, in the community that's meeting here in the CBA conference for, for some time, but I think have become um, increasingly recognized by, uh, by wider policy audiences as well. And here we're talking about um, uh, teleconnected and transboundary risks. Um, where the effects of a particular hazard or event in one location have significant knock-on effects for um, locations elsewhere or for people who are not directly linked with them. So two specific examples here I think would be um, disruption to food chains and um, when their food supply chains um, when there is disruption to uh, agricultural production that's critical for particularly for crops which form the basis of um, low income, um, low in, uh, the diets of low income people in cities um, and how um, food price rises as a result of um, disruption to agriculture, which can be hundreds or thousands of miles away, um, can have significant effects on the health and well-being of people um, living in um, distant locations. Um, another would be around um, supply chain disruption and again a particularly urban phenomenon I think where um, manufacturing and industry um, where the effects of climate related disasters in one location can disturb the, um, the supply chains of production systems um, in very distant locations with a knock-on effect on the, um, on the economies of those places um, and on the livelihoods of people there. Um, a last element here as well, which actually forms a good bridge to the first point on the next slide, Aditya, um, is where there are um, uh, compound um, risks of various kinds. So if we look at the complexity of risks in urban settings, um, the stronger um, scientific evidence, for example, around the compound effect of higher temperatures and air pollution on human health. Um, so new forms of risk that are increasingly both being realized and being, um, and being recognized. So the, the point here as well is that then we have a, um, certain reasons why um, urban areas and low income groups in urban areas have magnitude, have, 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 have greater levels of, face greater levels of disruptive risk. Um, and a couple of the particular characteristics of um, urban settlements that help to, to drive that um, are here on this slide. So the complexity of urban settings, this isn't to say that rural areas do not have their own complexities, um, they certainly do. And I think one of the things we would be keen to stress um, is that argument, arguing for understanding um, these disruptive risks and resilience in urban settings um, doesn't seek to supplant discussions of disruptive risk and resilience in um, rural settings as well. But particularly in urban settings, the reliance on uh, complex networks to supply food, to supply water, um, complex economic systems around the provision of basic needs, um, um, the need for um, infrastructure, uh, networked infrastructure for risk reduction, all of which requires high levels of coordination between different actors and agencies, creates one of the settings which is a particular um, form, which drives particular forms of urban risk. And density, similarly, um, the um, concentration of people and of economic activities um, that are found um, in urban centres creates different forms of risk where, and whether it's for the spread of communicable diseases um, or whether it's because the effect of a hazard on a relatively small geographical area um, can have a substantial effect on a very large number of people or a very large number of industries or other economic activities. And the fact that cities are dynamic and have fast movements of goods and people in and out of their boundaries leads also to them becoming uh, at risk of particular kinds of hazards. For instance, 90% of all mortality and morbidity from COVID-19 has been in cities. And the fact that people from different geographic backgrounds, different linguistic backgrounds, castes, classes, all live in similar neighborhoods means that uh, cities pose particular challenges to participatory methods that are uh, 
predicated on generating consensus and also behavior change protocols such as lockdowns that require um, uh, changes in behavior. But at the same time, these challenges, these pillars of urbanization that pose challenges, if harnessed, can also pose substantial opportunities. The fact that cities are dynamic and diverse means that there is a potential for surfacing innovations mm -hmm. and for solutions. Um, also, just to highlight also the fact that cities um, have, are, are complex and dense means that there is a certain amount of governance capacities in cities that can be harnessed to manage risk. For instance, uh, through the New York Mayor's Office of Risk and Resiliency, uh, and the fact that cities are dense means that you could target people at risk more effectively. So this is all to say that cities are facing disruptive risk, uh, which, is, which entails outlier events, which entails transboundary risks, and which is rendering existing systems uh, less relevant. And while the concept of resilience, with its emphasis on flexibility, <clears throat> modularity, buffer capacity, is more relevant than ever, other, uh, and than ever, we argue that changes in methods and practices of building resilience are needed, specifically in five strategic areas of action. David? Yeah. Um, so we've looked at a range of areas where we think that there is potential for um, new forms of uh, resilience to, um, to be developed. Um, some of these uh, drawing on existing um, sound practices in urban areas around um, community upgrading, um, around um, uh, informal settlement upgrade, informal settlement and community upgrading, um, around um, economic empowerment for low-income groups, um, and around the movement towards a more um, inclusive and sustainable cities. So we have some good examples around that, sh that show um, how things can be done differently in towns and cities, um, which we think can be applied um, um, effectively um, towards um, um, to, um, towards um, uh, to, towards resilience as well. And I think that the next slide then goes into the five of these in more detail, um, which we can um, look at the transition from what the business as usual has tended to look like um, to what uh, a new um, form of um, uh, a new form of um, uh, disruptive resilience um, can look like. So we're going to start with um, the one on um, informality, whereas uh, in which urban development as usual has often um, overlooked, ignored or outlawed um, the informal, um, informal settlements and the informal economy, um, where there's been tended to be antagonism between municipal governments and low income groups. Um, the assumption being that slums and informal settlements are seen as a problem um, and are seen as an eyesore, they're seen as something which needs to be removed from the fabric um, of the city. Um, I think to date we've seen positive movements in urban resilience um, where there's been a recognition of the need to um, have informal sector participation um, in resilience planning, whether it's through um, creation of um, through um, problem identification, whether it's through adaptation planning, um, whether it's through the creation of projects that take place at the community level to reduce risk. Um, but that this has still largely been framed in the language of um, low-income groups living in informal settlements as being beneficiaries or being as recipients, being seen as um, recipients um, of projects, recipients of aid. So what we're proposing then is a disruptive model of urban resilience, um, one that's driven by partnerships rather than um, participation, um, where there is a, a deeper level of engagement in terms of problem identification, um, in terms of identifying the appropriate responses to problems, and in terms of um, uh, actually implementing the um, solutions. And uh, so this is a model of decision-making which is bottom-up and driven by um, local experience, of course, involving different actors, because one of the critical elements of um, the way cities function 
is this complex um, interaction between municipal governments, national governments, private sector and citizens. Um, but a decision making model which is more, uh, more genuinely um, uh, based on that um, deep level of partnership and that sees the um, levels of um, flexibility and responsiveness that are um, inherent in the informal sector, the informal economic sector and in informal settlements as being a part of the solution. And um, Aditya can speak to the Dharavi example better than I can. Sure, I think just to add um, that it's really interesting to see that the, uh, the city of Mumbai has defaulted to this model of engaging with the informal sector during COVID-19 when an emergency of this scale hit the city where uh, unlike the rest of India, where there's been a very top-down response to COVID-19, when a cluster of uh, infected people were discovered a few months ago, there was mass panic because given, because Dharavi is the most densely packed settlement on earth. Uh, and therefore the government decided that the only way it could be contained was by inculcating local level leadership and really engaging with Dharavi in a spirit of partnership. So what this meant was that the government drew in the informal and quasi-trained medical practitioners of Dharavi into a network and allocated different sectors of the settlement to them. They uh, engaged with community-based organizations that were already operating in Dharavi. They recruited a cadre of volunteers drawn from local residents to work with municipal employees to help survey the situation, uh, um, uh, looking at what was going on, and really relied on the local knowledge of people to make decisions. And we've included this example, not only to demonstrate the salience of this approach, but also to say that this is not business as usual, right? We're not simply talking about participation and forging spaces where we invite communities into decision-making that has already largely been set. This is about inculcating local level leadership, which is slightly different uh, from what's going on. And there are other examples of this, which include urban poor funds, which includes county climate funds in Kenya, where international climate finance flows down to the local level. And there are a growing number of institutional examples that prove that this is not just a value-laden, pie-in-the-sky type of statement. It's actually something that can be done and is being done in pockets here and there and needs to be scaled up. This is similar to our next pillar, which is on urban services and systems, which is uh, such as waste management, transport, energy, water. When it comes to these services and systems in business as usual, risk management is largely limited to contingency planning. There isn't any resilience thinking per se. Uh, in urban, urban resilience programs have certainly emphasized urban systems and services, but there's been an explicit emphasis on the installation of hard infrastructure to make these services more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Don't take my word for it. 97.6% of all the money that has gone from the global environmental facility um, into urban areas has been for the installation of hard systems. 60% of this 97.6% has been focused on the de de uh, development of transport infrastructure. Capacity building and training and developing the capabilities of people running these systems has largely been ignored. And therefore, in our concept of disruptive urban resilience, we propose that there is a sharp focus on developing the capabilities and capacities of people running these critical urban systems to make decisions under uncertainty. In this context, uh, existing ideas such as adaptive management have taken on a renewed significance, and there is a growing emphasis on approaches such as tactical urbanism, which, in, which entail low cost um, ex and temporary experiments to meet exigent circumstances. So instead of sinking money into uh, an expansion of cycling during COVID-19, what some neighborhoods have done in, in London and New York, they've painted over bus lanes because people are not using buses anymore and made them cycling lanes to make it safer for cyclists that have the numbers of which have rapidly expanded. Um, and also strategic ambiguity, which is another idea that comes from the corporate world. And in fact, uh, we read about it in the Harvard Business Review is when um, uh, you build in ratchets for transitions to short-term planning horizons in long-term plans. So for instance, if uh, IBM has a five-year plan, in that they build in a ratchet to say that we'll shift to a 90-day planning window, discard this plan temporarily if there's a big earthquake in California. And once again, it's really interesting for us to see that during COVID-19, 
a number of cities across the world have shifted to an adaptive management mode of doing things. Uh, and this is evident through the fact that uh, public transport and public spaces are being opened and shut in concert with the rise and fall of infection rates in cities like London and New York. This is happening reactively at the moment. And we argue that the capacity to do this proactively needs to, build, needs to be built within these um, service delivery sectors. Moving on very quickly, given the highly unprecedented nature of the disruptive risks that cities face, it will be essential to innovate because we don't know what awaits us. At the moment in urban development, as usual, there's very little innovation. There is some innovation, but it's rolled into uh, hard infrastructure. For example, Ho Chi Minh City is building a new uh, metro system. It's a flood prone city. So they've developed new technological solutions for insulating mechanical and electrical parts of the subway better. Uh, and so the model of innovation, when it happens, is kind of structured, static, and Eurocentric. Urban resilience programs in the mold of international development, like the ones you know, funded by big international donors, certainly have uh, innovation. But these are limited to management approaches, uh, new ways of engaging with communities, new ways of doing city resilience planning, new, way of, new ways of influencing government. It's, they're largely led by experts. And the sustainability of these quote unquote resilience projects is suspect. And therefore, we argue that there's a need to pivot to a much more frugal, bottom-up, iterative uh, model of innovation um, that aims to deliver solutions that are good enough rather than best possible. There are different names for this model, model of innovation. In India, it's called Jugar. Uh, in Brazil, it's called, uh, I've forgotten the name, what is called in Brazil. In Kenya, it's called Joakali. Um, and big corporations across the world are embracing this form of frugal innovation to meet uh, with developing exigent emergent situations. Um, and again, in the time of COVID-19, this form of innovation is everywhere. You must have seen uh, recommendations for how to enforce social distancing on planes by reversing the middle seat. But also interestingly, there's a long article in Nature recently that talked about all the alterations and amendments to established vaccine development protocols that have taken place to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. And the fact that multiple different experiments are being uh, carried out simultaneously, and they'll scale, scale up the one that works best. The fact that uh, regulatory processes have been abridged and the fact that we are basically aiming for a COVID-19 that's going to give us temporary protection for a couple of years and we'll need another booster dose after a while all is emblematic of these jugard modes of, um, uh, um, of innovation. And therefore, we argue that this the ability to do this kind of innovation needs to be built proactively by, for instance, organizing challenge funds, where you throw out a big challenge to grassroots innovators and reward people who come up with solutions to particular problems, or by supporting existing networks of grassroots innovators like the Honeybee Network in India, or simply by training the staff of urban resilience programs to recognize these local innovations when they're working within informal settlements and other parts of a city and scale them up as opposed to ignoring them for more top-down solutions. David, over to you for the next pillar. So the, the financial pillar is probably one that um, people who've engaged them um, throughout this conference will be quite familiar with some of the, the core arguments around. Um, making the drawing on the evidence of the limited amount of climate finance which has gone either to urban concerns um, or to adaptation concerns and specifically to the concerns and priorities of the lowest income groups and other marginalized groups in in cities and for each of those we can begin to see the you know, the, the gradual thinner and thinner slicing of how climate finance um, goes primarily on mitigation that that goes on adaptation doesn't go to the local level. That that does go to the local level on cities and um, tends to be privileged around things which are um, hard infrastructure priorities um, rather than on um, building the broader resilience of low income groups and um, through strengthening adaptive capacity and through um, addressing the, um, the, the basic needs of basic services which are fundamental to longer term resilience. So firstly, there's a relatively small amount of um, funding that goes 
um, two um, adaptation issue, um, issues in cities. Um, secondly, is even where there is um, a focus on resilience, um, this is still limited amounts um, and the uh, very high barriers to access. If we look at the um, conditions associated with um, access to climate finance um, and the capabilities of many of the groups in urban areas which are focusing um, on building resilience for low-income groups and we find that there's not the capacity um, or the right, not the type of capacity that is expected to be able to access those funds. So what we then propose are new models of um, finance for um, building disruptive um, resilience. Um, models of finance which are faster and more flexible, um, which are accessible by um, actors at the city scale, whether that is by municipal governments um, or whether, by, whether it's by um, grassroots and civil society groups. Um, that it is um, that these models of finance are um, accountable from the bottom up as much as from the top down in that the models of accountability are whether they um, whether this finance meets the needs of the groups that it's um, supposed to be um, helping. Um, the willingness to um, explore different modalities of finance included blended funds that bring together different sources of government owned source revenue, uh, municipal government budgets, um, climate finance, um, uh, grants from different sources. Um, so both have changed in the um, approach to funding and in some of the uh, modalities of funding. And this is going to require revisiting some um, different forms of finance that have already been um, that have been tested, but that are definitely tricky in an urban system. Um, for example, municipal bonds, um, green bonds of various sorts, which have begun to be explored um, in some middle income countries, particularly as a different way for cities to raise funds, which could be applied to um, resilience activities. But also uh, a tricky um, issue because whilst they do have a level of autonomy and targeting to the particular needs of cities, um, they also do have um, you know, raised questions about the um, ability of um, cities effectively to manage finance, particularly in cities with limited technical um, financial management capacities, um, and also questions about the, um, the appropriate way in which um, uh, cities and subnational governments are able to take on debt, um, uh, underwrite debt on their own. So a complex set of issues which need further exploring, um, but the conclusion really being um, that radically different forms of finance are going to be necessary for disruptive resilience. Thank you, David. And I think this point of bonds is really interesting because suddenly, again, in the time of COVID-19, they seem to be everywhere. And uh, I think six or eight weeks ago, the U.S. Federal Reserve announced that they're going to buy $500 billion worth of bonds from small and medium-sized cities across the United States to aid in COVID-19 recovery. Um, and I know that we also have some guests from Cape Town today uh, listening to us. And I think it'll be great to hear if they have any thoughts on Cape Town's recent experiment with a green and resilient bond. So just to finish up, the final pillar of this framework is around data. Um, and in urban development as usual, there's very little risk data that's really used. Yes, there is some risk data that's used, uh, but that's primarily used for climate proofing. And this essentially entails calculating the probability of certain extreme events and building infrastructure to that specification. Now, this is problematic for a number of reasons, mainly because uh, historical patterns are no longer a good guide to tell us what's going to happen in the future. And across the world, we've seen this approach to uh, using data for urban development fail. Um, what happened in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina is a sum of many different complex factors. One of those factors was that the flood protective infrastructure around the city was built to withstand a one in eight year event, whereas Hurricane Katrina was a one in 400 year event. So that shows you some of the drawbacks of using a certain kind of risk data for climate proofing. In urban resilience programs, uh, there is certainly some use of uh, risk information. Uh, um, you know, people use downscaled uh, climate models, satellite data, household surveys, census information to understand hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. But all these are kind of centralized, expensive, arduous, and expert-led. And to deal with the kind of disruptive, emergent, exigent problems we talked about at the beginning of this presentation, it's really important that we adopt 
distributive data approaches to understanding um, uh, risk. And by this, we mean two things. A, we mean distributed data that can, can come from ICT sources, ICT devices, and can be seen and it can be called big data. Uh, and this is proved effective in experiments all the way uh, taken that have taken place all the way from Bangladesh to Peru, where, for instance, uh, people have are understood that pinging off people's cell phone is really a, a, a useful way of figuring out how many people live in the path of Arakan, or um, uh, or another experiment that has crowdsourced battery temperature data from cell phones to understand which part of a city is going to face a heat wave. Happy to go into details about this um, in the question and answer. But equally important, the other kind of distributed data that we're talking about is data where people living in informal settlements survey themselves and make their localities visible to planners and decision makers called self-enumeration data. Slum Dwellers International has used this extensively in countries across the world to influence policy, but other cities need to wake up to the potential of these two different kinds of distributed data approaches. Uh, and again, it's interesting to see that in the time of COVID, both these type of data approaches are everywhere. Uh, suddenly uninnovative, um, unresponsive government institutions have realized the value of big data in decision-making through applications like contact tracing. But equally, again, um, as we were talking about Dharavi uh, earlier uh, on this slide, in Dharavi, the government recognized that the only way they could really understand what was going on in this neighborhood was, was by in, uh, inviting people from the neighborhood to help them understand what's going on. Um, and therefore, in this way, through new ways of participation, through new ways of building the capacity of people delivering urban services, through new modes of innovation, financing, and data, we argue that we need to disrupt the way in which urban resilience is currently being done and transition to a new way of um, doing these five things in order to deal with the kind of risk that we face. Now, um, I'll shut up in a minute, just two or three things to end with. One is that we understand that, yes, you know, there's very little to disagree with here. All these shifts are great. I'm, I'm very, we are very happy to be disagreed with, of course. But I get, for us, the really meaty questions are, on the factors that inhibit these shifts. What are those factors? How can we overcome them? And then really studying examples of where some of these shifts have been overcome and really distilling what we can learn uh, from those shifts. Um, so if there isn't anything else from David, I'll stop there and hand over to all of you for your um, questions. Um, uh, wondering if Becky, you want to help us moderate uh, some of these questions. Uh, do please tell us who you are before you ask the question. Um, and also please advise us on how we can take this agenda forward, what more we can think about, um, and any other suggestions on improving this would be really uh, appreciated. Yep, you can put any questions in the chat or you can raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Um, and we can do that for you. We have a question here um, from Tim, who said it's a really interesting framework. Uh, resilience frameworks have been mm -hmm. criticized um, for legitimizing <clears throat> leaving vulnerable places and people to solve these problems on their own. How does disruptive urban resilience take this criticism into account? Great, Tim, uh, fantastic question. I'll give a quick response and then hand over to David. First of all, um, we are very actively positioning this not as a framework, <laughs> but as a proposition. Um, but not to uh, not to quibble on that. Um, I feel this uh, the, our propositions actually stem from an acknowledgement of all the criticisms that have faced risk reduction approaches in urban and non-urban areas over the decades. The fact that we're arguing for community leadership stems from an understanding that local communities that really are at the forefront of the battle against climate change have not been empowered to make decisions themselves. The fact uh, that we're arguing for cap capability and capacity building stems from an acknowledgement that hard systems have received way more attention than this crucial part of building resilience. And the fact that we are arguing that cities need to have endogenous capacity to raise financing stems from an acknowledgement about how multilateral and bilateral financial sources are not enough to deal with the scale of risk that we're talking about. David, 
yeah, very little to um, add on that. I mean, and there is, there's a very, um, you know, there are very valid critiques. I mean, I'm thinking of a, um, a, an, the academic critique by Maria Kaika, you know, probably something, don't call me resilient and how um, actually framing people as being resilient has often justified, um, justified non-intervention or inadequate intervention in, to support people who actually do um, uh, do need um, to be um, you know, to to be supported rather than being left um, left on their own. Um, all thinking about the um, the um, other critiques around the the way in which the uh, resilience agenda has sometimes sat too comfortably um, alongside um, neoliberal models of um, urban planning and urban design. Um, that it's not this, you know, it seemed to imply um, continuity um, rather than fundamental change. And so I think, again, that's yes, what we're trying to, by, um, by inserting the, the, the word disruptive here, um, I think there's an element which is, um, which is tactical. I mean, there is a resilience agenda which has a significant um, swell of um, action and investment behind it. Um, that I don't think is going to go away. Um, and so there needs to be an internal challenge to doing that differently and better, and hopefully to disrupting the, the, the way that it is, um, the, the way that it's actually um, done. I think the next question there actually links very nicely to this as well, that's from um, Sushila um, about incorporating gender and inclusion issues um, is, is, a, is also a really um, substantial um, challenge here. Um, and I think um, you know that there's a you know, there's a very strong case that as we develop this further, um, we would need to it would be appropriate for us to ask the question: How has urban development, as usual, um, treated issues of gender and inclusion? In which case, we would say things like um, urban development, as usual, hasn't taken issues of universal design seriously, um, has tended to create public spaces which are. Um, which don't adequately take care, um, take account of the different gendered usage and different um, levels of um, gender um, comfort um, within those um, spaces. I think we could say the same for urban resilience as usual, where there's been a sort of um, an, an assumption, um, perhaps more of an assumption of um, um, uh, where a gendered assumption of um, women as um, as victims rather than as active agents, um, and that a disruptive urban resilience ought to uh, move towards a, a more gender transformative um, approach as well. Um, so, I mean, I think I, I think um, that this is a good um, um, you know a good point to um, for us to reflect more and elaborate more. And, and I don't know if Adit, you want them um, to um, pick up on that. No, I agree with everything you said, David. Um, and I think you're absolute. I, I think the comment, the question is very well taken. I think we need to do a better job of surfacing the gender dimensions of the five shifts uh, that we're proposing. Uh, but they're very much there. I mean, I just I, I want to be clear about that um, by uh, by making sure that we have a more democratic model uh, and local communities uh, um, are in the driving seat. We also want to make sure that uh, women and other marginalized groups, part of those communities and the driving, uh, in the driving seat by ensuring that we have distributed data approaches that communicate what's really going on on the ground. We want to make sure the realities of all groups, including and especially uh, women and other marginalized groups are communicated to decision makers. So it's very much there, but we take your point. I think we need to do a better job of surfacing that. Um, I'm going to take the easy way out and ask Sumiti to please come on the mic and explain to us, uh, explain her question to us uh, so we can have a little conversation on that because I think it's quite a meaty question. Um, thank you, Aditya. And at the risk of keeping my video also open for a bit, I'm at home and there's people coming in and out. I've basically been reading this paper by Roberts et al. You may have come across it from this recently released one which captures the resilience uh, journey of Durban. And uh, it talks about, and very nicely captures the different kinds of resilience. Your paper is also cited there, yours and Tanner's. And that's actually cited alongside uh, Gina's one, 
Tina Serfogel's one, which of course people from us are also contributed to, which speaks to this just and negotiated resilience, which is a step further from the critical resilience one. So I understand that a lot of the critique that has been discussed already has now been parceled into a social ecological resilience, which goes along with the neoliberal agenda probably, or can. Um, however, the critical and the just and negotiated ones are then forefronting, um, uh, for example, gender issues, class issues, caste issues. So my question is, I very much find this a very uh, exciting proposal. As you have said, it's an idea, although it does look like a paper in the making also. Um, my question again is because of the time period that we are in and you spoke about the business model of using a window for trying lots of things, you know, and if you map that onto the adaptive renewal cycle that uh, Gunderson and Holling obviously use for Penaki, etc. There we are in that phase of uh, a birthing and experimentation of lots of things. So are we then saying that this disruptive resilience is temporary? So this model is not recommended forever, but it's specifically for a certain window of opportunity that the COVID pandemic represents. And, and there may be some elements of it that can then be combined with those that have really been fought hard for, I feel, the, the critical one and the just and negotiated one, which speak to uh, uh, the slow urbanism uh, narrative that other uh, colleagues from SPA have worked on. Um, uh, I forget her name, I think Ayona Datta uh, has spoken about it in terms of smart cities. So yeah, just, I, I know there's a Good. lot, but Thanks for making all these ideas come up through your presentation. Not Very at all, Sumitri. Thank you for attending uh, this and for your comment. I might take the easy way out and go to David first. No, I mean, I, I that thought provoking, thought provoking and helpful. And I mean, I think the um, you know the the Durban uh, the written up Durban example that you point to is a really useful one here um, because it tries to unpack the ways in which uh, externally defined resilience agenda um, can, uh, well, an, an, an extremely well-intentioned and well-resourced but externally defined resilience agenda um, can meet all sorts of difficulties when it comes into contact with um, the, particular, um, the particular messy politics and society um, and the and also where there is a highly skilled set of people um, locally as well to be able to address resilience. Um, so I mean I think I think I, I find I find that a challenging piece to engage with because an awful lot of what we're um, trying to do is to make a case which can be taken um, to different places where which can be taken to tens or hundreds of cities and um, that haven't yet engaged with this agenda seriously uh, but being aware of the pitfalls of putting forward this sort of approach is a um, in, 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 in a in a vacuum almost uh, I think the the way we would try to respond to it is by um, grounding um, you know, grounding the um, particular conditions, um, the particular recommendations with um, examples from particular conditions to show how ideas and lived realities need to come together and be negotiated in particular contexts, which I guess is also one of these things about how um, effective approaches to addressing urban poverty through community driven approaches have tended to operate as well. Um, to take the the local um, extremely seriously. I mean, there's a lot more in what you said, Samita, which I need to sort of um, reflect and engage on. So, I mean, thanks thanks for pushing us on it. <clears throat> yeah. So there's a question. Sorry, I was reading it very quickly on <clears throat> identifying. So I think that's a very good question on how do you identify different people who are at risk in a city, and I think. I guess. The core, the core tenet that cuts across our five pillars is about individual agency. And 
all these actions are in one way or the other geared to making sure that people who are on the front lines of risk are, have the, are empowered to deal with them. And I think the, to speak to your question more directly, our pillar on data uh, tries to embody that principle most directly by talking about distributed data where uh, people in informal settlements have a platform to make their own spaces and their own individual risk context visible uh, to decision making, decision makers. But I also think that big data can be a, one of the solutions here. And I know um, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this from the uh, <laughs> community development folks. I'm not saying supplant um, uh, or exchange. I'm saying complement existing approaches of doing robust participatory work with new forms of big data applications that are proving uh, relevant even in developing country contexts, which have high internet penetration, high mobile penetration, allowing for even marginalized groups to make their realities evident in decision-making processes. Any other questions before I... Um, I've just seen one a bit further yeah. up. Um, there was one from Sushila who said, another one um, who hmm. she asked, so the chair of the slum dwellers said that they should, <clears throat> there should be no rural or urban different dynamics, rather a continuum. And what were your thoughts on this? Yes. Hmm. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, it's... It, it, well, it's a yes and a no. I mean, I think the, what we what I tried to say earlier on uh, is that there are certain features that do create particular forms of risk that are urban, um, and that are particular forms of risk um, which um, which, which uh, affect low income and informal neighbourhoods in urban areas. Um, I think it's perfectly possible to um, to say that and accept that. Um, without saying that there is a clear breaking point at which um, you know something ceases, you know, where where there is a fundamental difference, a fundamental breaking point between an urban and an a rural um, uh, reality. Um, I mean, the other element, of course, is that with the recognition of connected risks, um, just thinking about the most basic of the um, of the. Um, urban systems that are necessary to sustain life. If we're thinking about um, food, um, food security and food insecurity in um, in urban areas, um, where uh, food comes from outside the city, but it's not just um, produced and then consumed. There are these complex networks of food production, distribution, um, marketing, um, storage, preparation, and at all of these stages, there can be links between the rural and the urban or the way in which water supplies reach urban areas um, that are uh, extracted from uh, river basins far away or extracted from groundwater within the city. Um, so the, you know, the connections between um, urban areas and the, um, and the surrounding areas are just so dense that they can never be fully unpacked. So I think, the, um, I think yes and no is actually a fair answer. And um, there are links, but equally, um, the density of um, political connections and economic connections and the reliance on markets and the density of people do create some features which need a distinct focus than if we're dealing with a primarily um, agriculture-based economy or a more dispersed pattern of settlements. Great, thank you, David. Um, I know we only have about five or six minutes remaining. We'd love to take more questions, but also I was wondering if I can abuse my um, moderator's privilege here and pick on a couple of people uh, to share their experiences. Um, please feel free to refuse, but if there are no more immediate questions, it would be really great. Olivia, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about Cape Town. I'd love to hear whether you feel how this resonates with what's going on there. And um, also to know what you think about the resilience bond. Hi. Uh, yeah, happy to. Um, I'm, I, I can't speak to the resilience bond, although I'm afraid um, that I do not have any particular expertise or knowledge on. So um, maybe someone else could pick that side of it up. Um, but in terms of the uh, the um, uh, 
discussions around sort of embracing informality and um, that's where I have done a bit of work and um, one of the things that I found in, that, um, in my previous research that I'm taking forward into my PhD um, is that when I spoke to um, when I spoke to government officials um, in Cape Town um, specifically around the water crisis and resilience um, of informal settlement dwellers um, a kind of common response that I received through the whole uh, through quite a few interviews um, was and obviously I'm paraphrasing but you know we don't, we don't really have to worry about them too much they're already resilient because of their circumstances and um, which I found to be interesting and also very concerning um, because it did mean that um, there was this invisibility for them within the policies, the actions, the um, the work that was actually taking place. Um, and when when you spoke, when I spoke to people in informal settlements, they said the complete opposite. No, we are not resilient. We are very vulnerable, and we need help. Um, so there was a complete kind of mismatch between um, what the what the sort of assumption was. For the informal communities and what the informal communities were saying themselves and um, so that's sort of what i'm taking forward into my phd research um although i'm i'm just going into second year now so i haven't and obviously i'm COVID delayed um so i haven't done new, all the new interviews yet um but that will be sort of the beginning of the next year um so i don't have much okay. more to add at the moment I'm afraid. No, that's <laughs> that's really that's really useful thank you for joining us today yes. um might ask mary to jump in very quickly mary dupa from cdkn uh, may you tell us a little bit about uh, how this aligns with uh, lots of the uh, urban resilience work that CDKN has undertaken? Sure thing. Hi, nice to see you all and thanks for the fantastic presentation. I got so much from it. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we've been doing some case studies and I popped um, something in the chat there about one of them that we just published based on some work in northern India. Um, I guess that uh, our kind of experience would align with, with your findings and recommendations quite well. Um, one thing that you didn't explicitly know, I don't think was about the role of knowledge brokers or intermediaries. I know it's a bit of a sensitive one because um, they can be part of the problem as well as part of the solution. Is you know very much a case by case thing, but I suppose that we are seeing in places like Gorakhpur in northern India that where you have a very credible, trusted, and sensitive NGO, uh, you know they can be really instrumental in sort of helping the community members to um, build their capacity, sort of working on a very equal partnership basis with them to understand what they think they need and, you know, what the intermediary NGO can provide. And also universities actually, you know, um, can play these kind of facilitating roles. We had some work um, in the previous phase of uh, CDKN, both in Brazil and in Jamaica, where actually um, students were very instrumental in uh, sort of, uh, again, uh, consulting with community members on a very kind of peer-to-peer -peer basis on what they felt their um, vulnerabilities were and resilience needs, and then enabling the introduction of technologies, and I mean particularly mobile apps and that type of thing. Um, which the students co-developed with them uh, to help them to sort of track different climate impacts and vulnerabilities that could then be aggregated um, via the apps and then fed into governmental decision making processes to mobilize funds more appropriately. Um, so those would be, I guess, two, two more thoughts to add to the mix. And then just um, on Olivia's last point, um, about, oh, actually, I'm not resilient, I'm feeling vulnerable, <laughs> you know, I think um, one of the things that our Voices from the Frontline initiative with um, ICAD has really highlighted, that has been an initiative to really gather uh, community level stories of coping with the um, sort of cascading, you know, risks of the COVID pandemic, along with economic shocks and stresses and climate impacts, is that, um, you know, communities are demonstrating absolutely extraordinary coping mechanisms, but they do also need forms of external support, but what they can really do, so it's not an either or, it's a both and, um, 
what we're coming out and saying more as CDKN is that, uh, you know, they're articulating very specifically the types of external support that would be helpful. So it's like, listen, be more open to them. Um, because, uh, you know, if donors and other external actors, including different arms of government, would um, listen in a more meaningful way to what they are saying about what specific types of external support would be useful, then everyone would be better off. So. Great. Thank you, Mary. That's really useful because just to tell you, I think we want to progress this work uh, on by looking at examples of where some of these things are taking place. So I think your direction that we should look at some of these case studies is really very helpful. Um, I think we're coming on to one hour. Uh, a, I think maybe we can take another burning question if there is, or call this session to a close if there are no more comments or questions. Uh, everything is helpful. All comments welcome, please. David, any final thoughts from you? No, I've tried to respond to the question by um, um, by Tim and realize that my um, my attempt at irony might not have come through in the text that I've written, where I say that's a nice, easy question. I mean, it is an incredibly complex and challenging question. Um, and so just to make sure I'm, um, make sure I'm, I'm clear um, um, on that. Um, I mean, I think that the, um, you know, a, a lot of the questions here are challenging about what the um, underlying um, the underlying drivers are that create risk for low income groups in cities um, <clears throat> and what the, um, you know, the extent to which a resilience agenda can genuinely engage with and transform um, some of those underlying drivers. Um, and I think that's a very good, um, uh, you know, very good um, challenge for us to take away. I think the inclusion and um, gender and diversity um, challenge is another very good one for us to um, to, to take away. And the only other thing I would say as, as, as we're over time is, um, yes, as, as Adich has put into the text box as well, um, we've, we've shared the, um, a briefing paper that we've been trying to use as a, as a, a means of floating some of these ideas a bit more and um, do, do get in touch with, um, with, with either of us if you'd, if you'd like to um, engage on these topics and find, find ways to, um, to take them further and work together. So um, from me, thanks very much. Great. Uh, thank you all very much for me as well. Uh, Becky, any final thoughts from you? No, no, um, no, that was really good, really interesting. And thank you everyone for engaging so much in the, in the chat box. It's really nice to see as an organizer of CBA 14. Um, so thank you. And if there isn't any more, I'm going to end the meeting now. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks everyone.